Okay, that is preparing. And the other thing I have to remember to do is click the record button before we start this one live. I don't want to do that too far in advance because I have to go in and edit all that uh, extraneous stuff out afterward. But I will remember because I have a big note here that I can't possibly miss this time. Okay. <laughs> well, somehow I have to, uh, I have to mute that because that's going to be a problem coming through double here. Maybe I'm the only one hearing that. Uh, let me go back to my attendees. Are you folks hearing uh, me or are you hearing me and then 20 seconds later hearing me again? If somebody had raised their hand indicating that, 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 that they are doing that or not. Yep, we are, okay. All right, lower the hands. All right, gotta solve that problem. Haven't had that one before. I hope that solved the problem. Let's see. Okay, I don't seem to have any way to turn on audio here. Oh, wait. Hey, Lane, I see your hand is up and I just think I just turned your mic on. Can you hear me? No, okay. Yes, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, and, yeah. And I, we don't good. seem to be getting that double uh, anymore either. Could I close no. my screen here? I'm gonna okay. put my hand down too. I think that problem solved. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Always an adventure. Look at that, one minute before we begin. And uh, I hope everyone's seeing my screen. Oh, one more thing. Hey, Lane, raise your hand if you're seeing the, the title screen for the webinar, things they might not have taught you in Foyt School. Okay, everybody's seeing that. Okay, good. We are, <laughs> nothing's ever simple. We are all good to go though, I believe. Okay. Um, I see other hands coming up there, but we really need to get started. That's good to know that that will work. So we'll be all, be all set. All I have to do now is I'm going to click the record. Resume recording. I do believe we are, <laughs> we are set to go. Nothing is ever, nothing is ever simple on this. All right, my clock says that it is two o'clock. So I will say hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. Things they might not have taught you in flight school. This will be a departure from my usual webinar format where I usually present a concept, aircraft accident examples, and then discuss how the accidents might have been avoided. Today, we'll just have some fun talking about some of the lesser known or frequently misunderstood aspects of aerodynamics and aircraft performance as they relate to general aviation airplanes. We usually begin the live seminars by pointing out the exits in case of emergency, but um, I don't think we need to do that today. Hopefully you know where your own bathroom is and all that. But our emergency would be a system crash of some sort. 
in the unlikely event of a water landing, um, no, I mean, in the unlikely event of a system crash, please check my website for a new schedule time. Just in full disclosure, we are, I am in Western New York State uh, between Rochester and Buffalo, and we are having quite the um, storm as we speak. We're supposed to get wind, uh, wind gusts of up to 70 miles an hour, and the peak time was supposed to be two o'clock. I think we dodged that one. It wasn't uh, that bad when I got started on this, but uh, I have all kinds of backup generators and backup power supplies on the computer, and um, we won't go out of electricity no matter what happens. But um, when we lose electricity, the internet goes down, <laughs> which is not something that we can control. So I don't expect a problem, but if it does, I'll post something on my website, and we will begin again. I understand that we have some folks online today who have not participated in any of my events previously, so I'll give a very brief introduction. My whole life has resolved around aviation. I took my first official flying lesson at the age of 14, and I soloed on my 16th birthday. That was in 1962, so you can do the math on my age. I had a great career for which I am extremely thankful. I've flown everything from jets to cubs, but flight instructing was always my preferred activity. I've given more than 8,000 hours of dual instruction. I have continued with my psychology background to do work in human factors. For five years, I served on the safety committee of the National Business Aviation Association as the human factors person in their fitness for duty working group. And I was also an annual presenter at the NBAA convention for many years. You can uh, hopefully see my uh, uh, the information, my contact information on my website. You can sign up from that for my safety publication, Vectors for Safety. And if you'd like to email me, I am available at gene at genebenson.com. And I can't seem to bring up YouTube. Well, what do you know? It worked. I'm here, I just needed to mute my laptop before it drove us crazy. Okay, back to work. I wanna thank Avemco for their sponsorship. They're not specifically sponsoring these events, but over the last year, they've sponsored some of my live events and um, they've been just great to work with. They've, um, they've made it possible to, for me to upgrade to a webinar subscription instead of just the uh, uh, meeting subscription and, um, and that's been very great and I really appreciate it. You may not know, uh, they're the people who pay for the wings pins when we earn a, a phase of wings and, and we get a, get a pin in the mail to wear. Avemco picks up the tab for those. So it's been quite a pleasure to work with all those folks. All right, into this. Our objective. Let's just have some fun looking at some commonly unknown or maybe frequently misunderstood aspects of aerodynamics and aircraft performance. I just kind of felt out a few things here that, um, uh, that seemed appropriate. I've been working on a, a new online course called uh, Pilot Finishing School, but that hasn't been finished yet, pardon the pun. The pun. So I got a few things out of that that I'll um, be discussing in there. We'll begin with something very, very basic. I know everybody knows this, but stick with me because, well, review never hurts, right? I'm sure you all know what causes a stall, but because it is so important to several things we'll talk about, I just want to review it briefly. The graphic shown here, we see an airfoil in pretty much straight and level flight. Here is the direction of flight and um, the relative wind is always exactly opposite the direction of flight. So there's a basic concept. Now we all know that increasing the angle of attack until we exceed the critical angle of attack is what causes the stall. The air can't flow smoothly over the upper surface of the wing and it gets a burble and the stall occurs. But let's make sure that we also understand that the airplane can be stalled in any attitude, including the level attitude. The graphic here represents the airplane in a level attitude, but descending. The angle of attack is once again greater than the critical angle of attack, so the airfoil is stalled. Among other things, this illustrates why we need to lower the nose if the engine fails. If we hold the nose level, the airplane will descend in a level attitude. Relative wind starts coming from below, increases the angle of attack, and we just might get a stall on our hands. I, uh, I see nothing on my YouTube screen, unfortunately, here. So, well, 
if it isn't, it isn't. I just, because we just can't. Uh, uh, okay, well, I'm not seeing any screen on there. I hope that, hope the graphics are coming through. All right, the stall is always, always, always caused by exceeding the critical angle of attack. Picture the airplane attempting to pull out of a dive. The pilot desires a flight path. Oh, you know what? I think I need to change something here. Bear with me, I'm sorry for the interruptions here, but I think we're, I think I'm doing something wrong on the YouTube thing. If anybody's on the YouTube, I don't know, you can't really let me know. Oh, somebody just is on there and says it's working on this end. Okay, thank you, thank you, Thomas, for letting me know that. All right, good, 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 good. Okay, back to work. A stall is always caused by exceeding the critical angle of attack. We know that. Um, the picture of the airplane attempting to pull out of a dive. The pilot desires a flight path like shown by the dashed line. But because of momentum, the airplane continues on a downward path even though wings are level. Since the relative wind is opposite the direction of flight, the angle of attack becomes excessive and the airplane stalls while in a level attitude. That was actually, that concept was actually discovered uh, prior to World War II when airplanes were practicing dive bombing. They would dive and pull out of the dive and promptly crash. <laughs> well, it stalled. Well, how could you stall? You were going 300 miles an hour. Well, that's, that's why. They had so much weight from the bomb hanging off the airplane that the airplane immediately descended, increased the angle of attack, and the rest was history. Okay, a similar setup um, is in a steep turn. The lift acts perpendicular to the wing cord. Now, the vertical component of lift allows us to maintain altitude. The horizontal component of lift keeps the airplane turning, but a positive load factor is created. We can call it centrifugal force, but it's actually caused by the inertia of the airplane wanting to keep it going in a straight line, but we are forcing it to fly in a horizontal arc. Now, if the load factor becomes great enough that it exceeds the horizontal component of lift, guess what? That airplane will just sort of mush toward the outside of the turn, causing the relative wind to momentarily come from the bottom of the airplane. That rapidly causes an increase in the angle of attack. We might go beyond the critical angle of attack and guess what? Stall. All right, moving on from there, let's take a look at propeller operation. Now, many of these same concepts that apply to the wing also apply to our propellers. We'll start with a fixed pitch prop. Just to get our orientation straight, we're looking at the right side of the propeller as shown by the airplane overlay. We'll get the airplane out of the way so we can see what's going on. The prop is rotating such that the blade coming out toward us, visualize that, that prop blade coming out toward us, that's traveling downward. That's the, that's the uh, point of rotation, just to get that straight. Now the cord line of the prop blade, sound familiar, cord line of wing, cord line of prop blade, that's the green line. If the airplane is standing still on the ramp with the engine running, all the relative wind comes from the rotation of the propeller. The relative wind is opposite the direction of travel. So in our diagram here, the prop blade is descending and the relative wind is opposite or ascending. When the airplane begins to move forward, relative wind from the airplane movement is introduced. And that of course is opposite the direction of flight. This combines with the relative wind from the prop rotation and produces what I call effective relative wind. The angle between the effective relative wind and the cord line of the propeller blade is the angle of attack for the blade. Now, just like a wing, the blade can stall from exceeding its critical angle of attack. As we can see here, the fixed pitch propeller has a twist built into each blade. Look at the, the prop laying on the tarmac there. Uh, you can see the, see the difference. The pitch of the propeller blade is much, much greater at the root than at the tip. So here's a cross section of the blade near the root. When the airplane is uh, beginning the takeoff roll, the high pitch causes the angle of attack on the blade to be too great and much of that blade is stalled. But if we look at a cross section of the blade near the tip, the pitch is much less. The angle of attack is much less so the blade is not stalled. As the airplane accelerates, the effective relative wind changes and more and more of the blade is producing thrust. That explains why acceleration is slow at first, but then rapidly increases. As we reach our cruising speed, 
the opposite problem starts to occur. The low pitch near the blade tips causes them to fly at zero or even possibly a slightly negative angle of attack, and that prevents us from going any faster. So the fixed pitch prop really isn't very effective or very efficient at all airspeeds. So enter the constant speed prop. It has much less twist than the fixed pitch prop. The mechanism allows the blades to change their pitch to be efficient at a wider range of airspeeds. As the effective relative wind changes, the propeller blades adjust to maintain an optimum angle of attack. Here's the low pitch, high RPM setting that is used for takeoff. Note that the blade position resembles the pitch of the fixed pitch blade near the blade tip. And then here's the high pitch, low RPM setting that's used for cruise. Note that the blade position resembles the pitch of the fixed pitch blade near the blade root. Bear with me if you fly a constant speed prop airplane, you already know this, but anyone who may not be familiar with how the prop is controlled, here's how it works. This is the power quadrant of a Piper Arrow, I believe. The arrangement is pretty consistent across uh, manufacturers as long as you don't go too far back in history. Manufacturers just to put, used to put the controls wherever they seem to seem fit and there were some accidents caused by people grabbing the wrong thing, you know, pulling the mixture back when you mean to pull the prop back is usually not a real good thing to have happen. Um, the throttle uh, today, we're set up standard, the throttle is on the left, prop control is in the middle, and the mixture is on the right. Generally speaking, throttle's black, prop is blue, mixture's red. That isn't universally true, but it's, it's pretty true. Now, instead of the throttle controlling the engine RPM, it now controls the manifold pressure and the prop control adjusts the RPM. With some exceptions for some turbocharged airplanes, both the throttle and the prop control will be full forward for takeoff. But when power is reduced, the throttle will be retarded first, followed by the prop control, and finally, the mixture control will be adjusted if needed. The key is to avoid having a high manifold pressure and a low RPM. So we reverse the process when adding power. We'll enrich in the mixture if necessary with the mixture control, then increase the RPM via the prop control, and then finally bring the manifold pressure up with the throttle. We should always use the manufacturer's recommended power settings. But it is common to use squared power settings. That is, uh, running 24 inches of manifold pressure and then running 2400 RPM squared. Remember that the prop governor is adjusting the prop pitch to attempt to maintain the RPM that we have selected. Now, prior to landing, we will generally get the propeller control to the forward or high RPM setting and the mixture control to the full rutch setting so that we are properly configured for a go around. Um, before I totally leave that, there might be some exceptions to that mixture being full rich. As you know, if you're landing at a very high density altitude airport, uh, you may not be, want to run at full rich, but generally speaking, everything's full forward. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the airplane's turning tendencies because it is related to the propeller. We all know that we need to apply right rudder during the takeoff and climb. But there's so much more to the turning tendencies that result from the propeller spinning around. So let's take a look. Torque, that's the first one and that's a roll tendency. That's pretty simple. It's created when the prop rotates one way, the airplane because of equal and opposite reactions wants to rotate the opposite direction. Spiraling slipstream, well, that's a yaw tendency. That's created uh, by the corkscrew path. The air leaves the propeller, passes under the fuselage, and strikes the left side of the vertical fin. A roll, a uh, yaw tendency. And then finally, in our triad, we have gyroscopic precession. That's also a yaw tendency. Now, it only acts when the airplane is changing pitch attitude. Think of the propeller as a spinning disc acting like a gyroscope. When the airplane is changing pitch attitude, it's just as if a force was being applied to the gyroscope. In our example, the airplane is increasing its pitch attitude, so it is as if a force is being applied to the top of the rotating disc. If a force is applied to a spinning gyroscope, the response is as if the force was applied in the same direction, but 
90 degrees through the plane of rotation. So our apparent applied force would be to the left side of the disc as viewed from the cockpit. The result is for the nose of the airplane to yaw toward the left. Now, asymmetric power loading or P-factor is a yaw tendency. I guess I wasn't through with my three, was it? It acts uh, when the airplane is flying at a high angle of attack, such as uh, when we're in a climb. The descending blade has a higher angle of attack than the uh, ascending blade. Did I say that right? The descending blade has a higher angle of attack than the ascending blade. Therefore, it develops more lift, if you will, or in our case, thrust. Manufacturers build corrections into the airplane. They're designed to compensate for torque and spiraling slipstream during cruise. Here's a summary of the turning tendencies when they operate and their effect. Note that whenever the engine is running, the propeller torque and spiraling slipstream will be present. That provides us with one roll and one yaw tendency. Most manufacturers have building corrections for these factors that are about right for the cruise setting. But at low air speeds, high angles of attack, and high power settings, we need to help out by carrying some right rudder pressure. Likewise, in a cruise airspeed descent with a low power setting, we may need to carry some left rudder pressure since the corrections are working to overcome a force which we have greatly reduced. One of the common corrections for torque is to put the vertical fin on a bit crooked. So it's always providing some right yaw. A lot of airplanes, um, the 172 comes to mind. If you stand right at the front and you look right down and you really concentrate, you can see that the tail is put on crooked. That's not a manufacturing error. That's, uh, that's the way it was designed. And then also to help with torque, the engine mount is usually canted so that the engine thrust line is slightly to the right of the longitudinal axis. You can also see that, you know, what I've noticed, that's very difficult to see when you look in a cowling, even with the engine uncowled. But if anybody ever uh, has an engine mount out, like putting a new engine mount in, the engine mount is sitting on the floor by itself. You can clearly see that that, that engine mount is, uh, is canted a little bit. All right, now the wings are also mounted so that the left wing has a slightly greater angle of incidence. Remember the angle of incidence is the angle between the cord line of the wing and the longitudinal axis of the airplane. That, that uh, greater angle of incidence, we call that wash in. And the uh, left wing has a slightly greater wash in than the right wing. That means the left wing is always flying at just a little bit greater angle of attack. So it's generating just a little bit more lift than the right wing. And this helps to compensate for spiraling slipstream. It also explains why most airplanes drop the left wing in the stall because the left wing is at a higher angle of attack. So therefore it reaches its critical angle of attack just a little bit before the right wing and the left wing falls off. If you never knew why, now you do. It's interesting to note that when in a cruise descent, in other words, when we reduce power and lower the nose to maintain cruise airspeed, the corrections are working without the turning tendencies present. So we generally need to carry a small amount of left rudder or possibly even a bit of left aileron to maintain a coordinated flight. Okay, let's talk about the power curve. Still kind of related to the, to the propeller, but um, there's a lot more involved here in that. I have a YouTube video that's just on the power curve if, if you're really interested in that. I found that the power curve is one of the more misunderstood concepts in aircraft performance. Remember that parasite drag, that's all the stuff on the outside of the airplane, um, plus interference drag and, and all that sort of thing. That increases with the square of the airspeed. Parasite drag increases with the square of the airspeed. We double the airspeed, what do we get? Four times the parasite drag, okay? Now induced drag, that's a product of lift and it decreases with angle of attack because really what is induced drag? Induced drag is the rearward horizontal component of lift. When we have a high angle of attack that just tips that farther back, okay? So induced drag decreases with the angle of attack. Now, total drag is the sum of the parasite drag plus the induced drag. So we can see it all on our, all on our graph, graph here, all right? Now let's simplify our graph and just look at the total drag curve. Then we can add a thrust available curve. 
This is for a fixed pitch propeller. The curve um, has its particular shape because of the difference in a propeller efficiency at the different air speeds. The power on stall speed is found at the lower speed at which the curves cross. This would be the speed at which the airplane would stall when doing a departure stall at full power. The curves cross again at a higher airspeed. And that would be the maximum level flight airspeed. It's not the red line airspeed, but it, it's simply how fast that airplane will go in level flight with full power applied. Okay, oops, there's our max level flight speed. I needed to click one more time there. Now, VY, remember what VY is? Best rate of climb, right? That occurs at the airspeed where max power is available, while VX occurs at the airspeed where? Where max thrust is available. There are actually some other variables such as the angle of the thrust climb, but that's too involved for our discussion today. We should know that the airplane climbs solely because of excess thrust. No other reason. The airplane become, climbs because of excess thrust. The greater the distance between the curves, the more excess thrust we have and the greater the rate of climb. That explains why rate of climb decreases as altitude increases. The thrust available is decreasing because the engine is producing less power. Okay. Now, we heard the term flying in the region of reverse command. It's typically called flying behind the power curve. Behind the power curve simply means that more power is required to maintain level flight at slower airspeeds. You can demonstrate that in your, in your airplane. You go out, just, just watch out for the stall, make sure you're provisioned, because uh, it's pretty easy to stall when you're doing this. But uh, uh, get the airplane at a, at a low airspeed very low airspeed, and note how much power it takes to maintain level flight. Now slow the airplane down another three or four knots and you notice you're descending. You have to bring in a little bit more power to maintain altitude. That's behind the power curve. More power is needed to fly at a lower airspeed because induced drag is, is so great. All right, notice the considerable difference between airspeeds for best angle of climb and best rate of climb at low altitudes where we, where we go around. As our, our altitude increases, the curves get closer together until we reach the absolute ceiling where they're the same. But the lower we are, the greater the difference between best angle of climb and best rate of climb. And those are the altitudes at which we have to do a go around. So we need to be careful of that. All right, for a tip, for maximum altitude loss on a stall recovery, lower the nose to the horizon or maybe just below and hold the altitude until the airplane accelerates to VX, then increase pitch to maintain VX until the obstacles are cleared. Obviously, I'm talking about, you know, we've added full power as we, as we do this, but um, want to lose the least amount of altitude during the stall, lower the nose to the horizon, maybe even slightly below, and, um, and, and just hold that until the airplane accelerates to VX, then increase your pitch to maintain VX until the obstacles are cleared. I think I clicked two, two buttons here. I did. We're back where we belong. Look at that. Let's take a moment to review maneuvering speed or VA. <clears throat> That's one of those things that uh, does tend to be misunderstood also. We're not going to become mathematicians here. Uh, everybody knows that I'm not. So uh, we're going to just kind of step through some calculations here. When you see maneuvering speed published in the airplane, that's published for maximum allowable gross weight. But maneuvering speed actually decreases as we decrease the weight. Yeah, yeah, did you know that? Frankly, the light airplane, we're more likely to overstress that than we are the heavy airplane. It kind of seems weird, but it's true. Here's our formula. The uh, actual maneuvering speed, to find that, we take the published maneuvering speed and we multiply that by whatever we get if we take the current or the actual weight of the airplane divided by the maximum allowable gross weight. Okay, we'll step through that. Let's say our airplane has a published maneuvering speed of 110 knots. 
The airplane has a maximum allowable gross weight of 3,100 pounds, but today we're only flying with 2,550 pounds. So if you wanna do the math, I don't, but uh, you can run that out on the calculator and the actual maneuvering speed is 99 knots. Now that's 11 knots below what the published maneuvering speed is. You think you can get into some trouble if you're maneuvering at a light weight? You bet. Or a simple rule of thumb, because I know that most people are not going to pull out a calculator before they fly every time. For every 2% reduction in weight, reduce the max weight maneuvering speed by 1%. So if we're 20% less than our maximum gross weight, we reduce our maneuvering speed by 10%. Not perfect, not precise, but then again, our airspeed indicator probably isn't perfect or precise either, so close enough. All right, where does maneuvering speed come from? Probably not the stork. This is what is called a VG diagram. It's for a specific airplane. Uh, the example here is from an FAA diagram and it's generic for a utility category airplane, just so we know what we're doing <clears throat> as we go forward. An airplane operating in the utility category must be able to withstand a positive load factor of 4.4. This could also be referred to as 4.4 Gs and it's called the limit load factor. Positive load factors are what are encountered when we feel like we're being pushed down in the seat, such as pulling out of a dive or when we're in a steep turn. A negative limit load factor for a utility category airplane is negative 1.76. Of course, negative Gs are what we feel when we push the nose over aggressively. Exceeding the limit load factors when operating in excess of the maneuvering speed may result in permanent structural damage or even in an in-flight breakup. The whole concept behind maneuvering speed is provided with a reference speed below which the airplane will stall before it is structurally damaged. The idea of a stall when instrument conditions at night and in turbulence, that's not very appealing, but it beats having the airplane come apart. So if we're flying below maneuvering speed and we experience increased load factors, the airplane will stall before it's damaged. If we're faster than maneuvering speed and we exceed, exceed the 4.4 Gs, the airplane may be permanently damaged. If we exceed the ultimate load factor, uh, when above maneuvering speed, the airplane may suffer a structural breakup. And none of us want to do that. Uh, the VG diagram begins with an unaccelerated stalling speed. Unaccelerated would indicate a load factor of one, where the one G line intersects the curve would indicate the stalling speed. The maneuvering speed is determined by entering at the 4.4 G point and intersecting the curve. Dropping down to desired line provides the maneuvering speed for positive load factors for the particular airplane operating in the utility category. Now we do the same thing, but for the negative limit, uh, negative limit load factor of 1.76, and we determine that airspeed. The lower of the two values will be the maneuvering speed to use. Remember that the maneuvering speed is not shown on the airspeed indicator. It's on a placard somewhere on the instrument panel. The VG diagram also shows where the color markings on the airspeed indicator come from. The upper limit of the green arc is the maximum structural cruising speed. In this case, um, it's the airspeed above which a load factor less than negative 1.76 will cause damage. The red radio line or never exceed speed, well, this is where damage will occur regardless of the load factor. Let me say one thing before we leave that, uh, that negative 1.76 seems like, wow, that's, that's not very much. But remember, we're not starting from zero on that. For the positive 4.4, we're starting from zero going up 4.4. I'm sorry, we're starting from one and going up to 4.4, which is actually 3.4. But we're always starting from one. So the negative 1.76 is actually negative 2.76 from our, our beginning point. So the airplane isn't quite as delicate in the pushover or negative G situation as, uh, as that would lead us to believe. All right, I do wanna just briefly hit on a couple of, uh, just one X, uh, no, I guess a couple of S, uh, accidents here that related to maneuvering speed. Um, the in-flight breakup is much less common than the loss of control accident, but it does occur and it should be discussed. 
And this accident uh, happened in Utah. Uh, dual instruction, night flight, the aircraft broke up while maneuvering. Uh, pilot, commercial, CFI, it was a PA-28-235. The NTSB said the probable cause was the pilot exceeded the design stress limits of the airplane, which resulted in an in-flight separation of the wings and horizontal stabilizers. Contributing to the accident were the night lighting conditions, clouds, turbulence, and icing conditions. So how do you think this started? I think this probably started as a loss of control accident and um, or loss of control incident. And in the process of trying to regain control, the pilot uh, overstressed the airplane. Pretty tough, uh, tough to be doing, uh, you know, recovering at night and turbulence and all that sort of thing. Now here's a different one, <clears throat> private pilot and a beach baron. This accident would also come under the category of high risk activities. April, 2007, um, Hamilton, Georgia, the multi-engine rated private pilot was returning home from an air show with four of his friends. He had stated that he thought he could roll his Beach Baron BE-58 and had tried previously, but a passenger intervened and stopped him. He tried again and ended up with all aboard dead. Um, now think about this. We've been to an air show. We've just watched all these aerobatics. Ooh, I can do this. Yeah, watch me. <laughs> hey, watch this. Hey, y'all watch this. Um, the NTSB said it was due to the pilots exceeding the design stress limits of the airplane while performing aerobatics in a non-aerobatic airplane, which resulted in an in-flight overload failure of the airframe. A factor in the accident was the pilot's decision to perform aerobatics. You think? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a lot more of this goes on than, than you think. I have uh, another multi-engine airplane accident where somebody was out doing aerobatics in it and lots and lots and lots of single-engine airplanes that were not certified for aerobatics. Not a good idea. Okay, let's talk about weight and balance. Everybody's favorite topic. I know when I taught ground school, everybody just couldn't wait to get to weight and balance, okay? Eh, maybe not so much. Well, it's basic, but many pilots have been taught something that is incorrect, so I want to I want to fix that. We might have been taught that in cruise flight, with, uh, lift equals weight. That's fine for a simple discussion, but unfortunately, it's simply not true. Remember the tail down force? That is what allows the airplane to fly in a nose heavy configuration so that nose will drop in a stall and allow us to recover. But how do we account for that downward acting force? If lift and weight were truly equal, then the airplane would descend because of the additional downward force created by the horizontal stabilizer. So, it's more accurate to add the tail down force to the weight and talk about total downward acting forces. So we can compare total downward acting forces to total upward acting forces. Now it gets a bit more complicated because the nose is raised, such as in a climb attitude, the thrust actually adds an upward acting component. We'll ignore that for now and just talk about cruise flight. If the airplane remains, uh, if the airplane weight remains the same, but we move the center of gravity, we can have some control over the tail down force and there so, uh, therefore also over the total downward acting force. Let's say our airplane weighs 2000 pounds. And let's say the center of gravity posi uh, present position, we need a tail down force of 200 pounds. And that's, uh, that's actually pretty typical, about 10%. That means we have to generate 2200 pounds of lift to maintain level flight. Makes sense. If we, owe, if we load the airplane such that the center of gravity moves forward, the airplane becomes more nose heavy and requires more tail down force to maintain level flight. So now maybe we need 250 pounds of tail down force to maintain uh, level flight. That means we now need to increase the amount of lift generated to 2,250 pounds. But if we load the airplane such that the CG moves aft, the airplane becomes less snow heavy, uh, less yeah, okay. Less nose heavy, that shouldn't be that hard to say, and requires less tail down force to maintain level of flight. So now maybe we need 150 pounds of tail down force to maintain level of flight. That means we can now decrease the amount of lift generated to 2,150 pounds. So what's the difference? Who cares? Well, it can make a substantial difference in our cruising speed. If we need more downward acting force, and therefore more lift, we'll have to fly at a slightly higher angle of attack. 
the increased angle of attack produces more induced drag and decreases our airspeed. But if we can reduce the amount of tail down force, we will not need to generate as much lift. We can then fly at a slightly lower angle of attack, reduce the amount of induced drag and have a higher cruising speed. Make sense? But it's critical to make sure the airplane is loaded so that the center of gravity falls within allowable limits. That's the best insurance that a spin will be recoverable if altitude permits. If the airplane is loaded with the CG too far aft, spin recovery may not be possible regardless of the altitude. Before I leave that subject, the airlines pay very, very close attention to where the center of gravity of the airplane is located in terms of uh, fuel. The fuel tanks, you know, typically there'll be wing tanks and a belly tank. And the belly tank is typically farther aft than the wing tanks. So try to put fuel uh, in the belly tank. And a lot of airplanes have two belly tanks and they'll transfer fuel from one um, to the other. I remember in the 737, the, uh, there was a, a procedure for, um, for moving fuel from one tank to the other to keep the center of gravity farther aft. So we would uh, well, we'd use less fuel. That was the objective of the game. And in those days, though, the range of the 737 wasn't sufficient. If, if you didn't do that, you might have to stop for fuel at, a, at a, an airport prior to your destination. And that, that was highly frowned upon and highly embarrassing. All right. Why is coordinated flight so important? Instructors always say, oh, look at the turn and bank. Look at the turn coordinator. Step on the ball. Look at that. You're out of, out of coordination. Who cares? Well, actually, we should all care. The stalls that are demonstrated by many flight instructors during student training are not indicative of the accident stalls that result in maneuvering flight accidents. Now, I'm also going to say that a lot of the stall accidents we see aren't really stall accidents. They're, uh, they're not stall spin accidents. They're, they're often mush accidents and that kind of thing. But, but nevertheless, um, we, uh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to have that happen to us. So training stalls versus accidental stalls. The accidental stall may have a nasty habit of developing into a skin. Um, yeah, I'm really having trouble talking. To you. They may have a have, nasty habit of developing into a spin because they're frequently entered from uncoordinated flight. Many flight instructors make sure the ball is in the center before the airplane stalls. Well, that's a good practice. It should be. But what if it isn't? Um, I think we really should give our students experience in entering a stall from uncoordinated flight because the chances are good if you botch the turn from, you know, uh, base to final or something like that, it's probably going to be uncoordinated. All right. The textbooks say that a spin is an aggravated stall resulting in auto rotation. Okay, I'll buy that. Another word for aggravated in our case is uncoordinated. So a spin is an uncoordinated stall resulting in auto rotation. The downward moving wing has a higher angle of attack and therefore is more stalled because of the wing um, exceeding the critical angle of attack, or more of the wing exceeding the critical angle of attack, I should say. A stall, as we said, is a disruption of smooth airflow and any disruption of smooth airflow results in increased drag. So, the, you know, one wing has a whole lot more drag than the other does. And here's uh, an unpleasant situation of an airplane coming down through a stall. Let's look at the phases of a spin. Okay, whoops. Well, entry, the first phase is entry. That's when you first start to make that little turn out of the, out of the, the stall and uh, the horizon starts to move sideways and, and that's, your, that's your spin entry. Then we have the incipient spin. The incipient spin, we're turning, but we're not fully developed in the, in the stall. The nose may not be down as far. We're not really wound up into the stall. And this is where, this is as far as most instructors ever let that spin with the student go, recover. Now I'm not totally opposed to that, because I do believe that it's more important to know how to avoid a fully developed spin than it is to know how to recover from one. But I like to see everybody have seen a fully developed spin um, at least once. 
So the incipient spin, then we have the developed spin. The developed spin, horizon's probably going around pretty quickly. Um, the nose isn't down as far as what it seems to be, but you sure are looking at ground out the windshield and it's turning and it's pretty darn scary. Plus that feeling in your gut, if you haven't done these before, is a little uneasy. So um, yeah, there you are. That's the developed spin. Now, depending on the airplane, if the airplane isn't certified for um, aerobatics, we don't want to go too far in this developed spin because we can get to the point that we can't recover from it. But we then we want to execute the recovery. What do we do in a recovery? We have to increase the angle of attack to a value less than the critical angle of attack. So yoke forward, unless you're inverted. I got into an inverted stall and a tomahawk one time uh, as a result of, well, anyway, that's another story, but I did, uh, that happened. So as long as you're not inverted and you're a spin, get the yoke forward, decrease the angle of attack. Obviously you've closed the throttle if the throttle was open. Apply opposite uh, rudder to the direction of rotation. That's usually, well, I guess if you're in solid clouds, it might be a little more difficult to, uh, uh, to see which way you're rotating, but uh, for the most part, the ground will tell you. If not, look at your turn coordinator. Turn coordinator or turn the bank, uh, it'll be pegged in whatever direction you're going. And then once the rotation has stopped, raise the nose as gently as possible considering terrain. If I'm at 5,000 feet, I'm gonna bring that nose up very gently because the airspeed is really building at this point. If I'm low, well, <laughs> I'm gonna bring the nose up as rapidly as I need to to prevent hitting the terrain. If I bend something on the airplane, well, so be it. Now, spin recovery insurance uh, is loading the airplane. As we mentioned before, we want to make absolutely certain we are within the manufacturer's specified range for the center of gravity. <clears throat> if you get that airplane loaded too far aft, um, you may not be able to recover from a spin. When they flight test airplanes, they put something on them called a spin chute that comes up out of the tail and the, the pilot can pull a lever and uh, that chute pops out and that stops the rotation, then you can recover. We don't have spin chutes. So, um, you know, if, if we stay within the CG range, that spin should be recoverable. A caution on that, um, read up on your airplane. There's probably some stuff out there. I know that, I don't know what, of course the airplanes aren't in production anymore, so I don't know whatever happened with it, but uh, the Piper Cherokee 140 had a problem. I worked for a company years ago that uh, we had a fatal accident with a student and instructor aboard. They were doing the required spin training for the ins instructor candidate. It was an instructor and an instructor candidate, I should say. And uh, they got into a flat spin and they yacked on the radio all the way down and, and they both died as a result of that accident. When they got in and, and examined this, <laughs> their you know, their calculations were okay, but what do all pilots, especially instructors and training pilots, maybe not as much today, but in the old days carry? A huge flight bag, right? I know I used to have a flight bag that had four Jepson charts in it, plus another Jepson publication that was as thick as the Jepson charts that had all the, the regs and the AIM and everything in it. Plus, um, you know, all my other instructing stuff, a couple of textbooks and, uh, you know, just, just everything I needed to instruct in the back. And of course, a student instructor is going to have the same kind of thing. Well, these guys got in this airplane to go out and do the, the spins. And what do they do with their flight bags? They both threw them on the back seat of the airplane. Now, those flight bags probably weighed 50 pounds a piece. So they put 100 pounds in the back of the airplane. So they first did the calculation of, okay, these two flight bags were in the back of the airplane and it brought it back almost to the aft limit, but not quite. So there still wasn't an explanation of why this, this accident happened. A little further investigation though revealed that when Piper had published the moment arms for the seat positions, they had published the moment arms for the two front seats at either, I don't remember now if it was at the full forward position or slightly after the full forward position. And these guys were both six feet plus and they had their seats in the full aft position. So when you took their weight and you moved them back another seven or eight inches, uh, maybe it wasn't that much, maybe five or six inches, I don't know. But anyway, it put them well aft of the, of the CG and they, they had no way of knowing that. They should have known about throwing the flight bags in the back, granted. But 
they had no way to know that that weight and balance was calculated uh, at that front seat position. So don't, you know, if you're, especially if you're flying an older airplane built in the 60s or the 70s or even older, don't take anything for granted. Check it out. All right. The flat spin is our nemesis if we are loaded too far aft. Uh, the relative wind is just coming from straight up. The nose doesn't go down. We need that nose down force to get the nose down so we can recover. And without the nose going down, we just can't can't recover from that spin and it gets us all the way into the ground. You can, there's all kinds of things you can try, you know, adding power and things like that, but uh, it's pretty much over if that happens. All right, how are we doing on time? Oh, we are good. I wanna deviate a little bit <clears throat> from um, our theme of aerodynamics and flight mechanics uh, here to talk about something else that I, I find very important. Far too many accidents happen shortly after departure. Sometimes airplanes collide with terrain, sometimes control is lost, lost while trying to avoid the terrain. Um, Pre-flight planning should include departure planning. For most airports, there won't be any problem. The, part, the, the departure will probably be fine. But I hate the word probably when it comes to safety in airplanes. So here's something you can do. It only takes a couple of extra minutes to be sure everything's gonna work, okay? Uh, the graphic shown here depicts a simulation of departing from Lebanon, New Hampshire, straight out on runway 18 on a pretty clear day. This illustrates departing at dusk with five miles visibility. Either way, make, let's make sure we'll clear the terrain at the end of the runway, whether or not we can see it, okay? Our customary VFR reference is the chart supplement. And we look at this for Lebanon, New Hampshire. This is the current, um, the current one. Uh, there are no particular hazards associated with departing on runway 18 or any other runway for that matter. But the terminal procedures publication that we normally only think of as being for instrument pilots, that tells a different story. There's no requirement to have an instrument rating to use the instrument procedures publications. They're available free online. So there's no good reason not to use them. Let's say, uh, let's see how there might be more to this uh, story of New Hampshire. The takeoff minimum section of the instrument approach procedures gives some cautions. Are the mountains softer if we're VFR? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. So let's use all our available resources and look at these things as well. Note the minimum climb requirement for runway 18, runway 18. It's 380 feet per nautical mile. Which instrument tells us our climb rate in feet per nautical mile? Hmm. Last I checked, none of them do. We can calculate our expected climb, uh, our expected rate of climb in feet per minute, but how does that translate to feet per nautical mile? Well, let's see. At the end of the terminal procedures publication, you can find this table, all of the terminal procedures publications, they have this table in there. Um, it's called the uh, climb slash descent table. We simply find the required climb gradient in feet per nautical mile from the page we just saw from the uh, instrument procedures book. Um, we find that, that column on the left, okay? And I know it's hard to see this, see this graphic, but anyway, it, we, we, we find that column on the left, climb, descent, uh, angle or degrees or uh, whatever there but that's not what we're looking for. We go to the next column to the right and that's feet per nautical mile. Okay, now that I've thoroughly confused you on that one. Um, so we look at our, <laughs> let me back up on this. <laughs> oh, once you get turned around, it's hard to come around. We simply find the required climb gradient in feet per nautical mile on the column on the left of this chart. And then, locate the ground speed you expect to have during the climb out along the top. The cell where they intersect states the climb rate required in feet per minute. So in this case, we must be able to maintain a minimum climb rate of 600 feet per minute. So can your airplane climb at 600 feet per minute going out of Lebanon, New Hampshire? If it can exceed that, then you're gonna be good to go. If not, well, maybe you ought to think about a different runway or a different day. Note that we're using ground speed. So if you're taking off into a 10 knot wind, your ground speed might be less and that'll help you out. If you can use a lower, lower ground speed, um, you know, that requires less 
rate of climb in terms of feet per minute. But a tailwind, of course, will go up, work against you. So remember, whatever you, uh, whatever number you determine here, that's a minimum. So always go a margin of safety on it. But a lot of uh, VFR pilots don't know about these these tables, and there have been a lot of accidents where people have taken off and they've flown right into the terrain off the end of the runway, or they saw the terrain coming up and they tried to turn to avoid it and and um, you know stalled or lost control of, of some way. So it's just an extra little thing you can do in terms of your, um, your planning. Now, oh. of course, if I'd clicked that ahead of time, that would have made it a whole lot easier. Um, there's our required climb rate in feet per, feet per nautical mile to the left, showing us 400 here. We determined 380 from the chart. We took a 90 knot ground speed and uh, it gave us 600 uh, feet per minute required to go. Should have clicked that before, okay. Always give a margin of safety though, in any case. All right. Uh, I wanna thank Avemco again for their sponsorship. Uh, I know I said it at the beginning, but they've been just folk, great folks to work with. They um, went way out of their way to uh, promote this webinar and the other two coming up this week. And uh, they, they, they stuck with me when, uh, when we maxed out the system and had to come up with an alternate way to do it. Um, so I, I do appreciate it. They've, they've been great for this. Um, I have a website, genebenson.com. There are lots of online courses on there you can do. Uh, they're all free except for one, which is a human factors ground school. But I put on there, I put a 50% off coupon if anybody wants to, um, to take that and get it a little bit cheaper. I have a free <clears throat> monthly newsletter, sometimes more frequently than monthly lately, but it's called Vectors for Safety uh, from my website. There's a sign up link for that. And uh, I, I, I try not to fill your mailbox with, with litter and trash and, and all that uh, sort of thing. And also in the shameless plug, I have some books on Amazon. Uh, the 50 Years of Flying Insights is available both in paperback and Kindle. The other two, which is a collection of articles that I've written in the past are uh, Kindle only, but, uh, but there they are. So uh, we're not ready to sign off yet, but um, I know some people will start dropping off soon. So I always like to close my presentations with uh, the same way I sign all my emails. Please remember, fly like your life depends on it. All right, I'm going to stop the screen share and turn my camera on and we'll see if we can do some question and answer. I apologize for this being a little rough around the edges, but I am on a learning curve here. All right, start the video and stop the screen share. And um, we're good. I am, um, oh, this is cool. I wish I'd seen this before. Anyway, all right, let me see. Um, I see Lane's picture there, that's pretty cool. The chat brings up who wants to talk. Lane, I think I just opened your microphone if you would like to discuss. I believe you did. <clears throat> yeah, yeah so, go ahead. so the the one question I tried to throw up there, let me get my hand down here. Um, so I would love to know what the aerodynamic explanation is for why a swept wing stalls faster than a straight wing, which would be why if you're yaw to the left or the right, that's the wing that stalls first and controls which way you spin. That is an excellent question. It is also a question for which I do not have an immediate answer. Uh, <laughs> that's something that I will have to research. I am not sure why that, why that is. I do know that when a swept wing airplane stalls, it could get very, very exciting, very, very quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know why it stalls. Uh, I had been stalls told that the swept wing stalls at a higher speed. It stalls sooner than your straight wings. And, and the reason that that information was given to me was to help me understand why, if I wanted to spin to the right or if I wanted to spin to the left, I would drag, you know, when I, if I yaw left or yaw right, that one wing is dragging behind the other. So I effectively have a swept wing on one side and an even more than straight wing on the other. That dragging wing loses its lift first. And that indicates that's going to control which way I'm going to spin. Oh, okay. I just Interesting. For those, for those, um, uh, for everybody else, uh, Lane is an aerobatic pilot and he flies a Kristen Eagle, I believe. So uh, yes. he's, he's our aerodynamics guy. All right, thanks, Lane. <laughs> Let me see. Um, 
Craig. Craig J, are you there? You had your hand up. I think I just unmuted you. Craig, oh, try again. It says, no, oh, you must have yourself muted, so I can't do that. Anybody else want to say anything? Go ahead and find that raise your hand symbol. Uh, symbol. I do believe it's located way down to the bottom of your attendee list, if you have such a thing. No, I bet everybody can't find it because hands have been coming up, but there are no more hands up at the moment. Let me try. Oh, here's one. Uh, They're moving around down here. William, I think I just unmuted you. Are you there? William W? Your hand was up and I see a microphone symbol. No, okay. Well, I'm gonna go over all the hands. If anybody else would like to say anything, try putting your hand up again and I will do my best. <laughs> Nobody, wow, okay, well, I won't take it personally, it's okay. So I'll, um, we'll, we'll close it out. I appreciate everybody uh, coming on board today. I'm doing another one on, um, on Wednesday and one on Friday. I'm just trying to give somebody something to do during this, um, this time, get the microphone out of the way a little bit there. Um, <laughs> the, um, the one I'm doing on Wednesday is one of my favorite presentations. It's called The Psychology of Approach and Landing. Uh, it's one that I, I first prepared it uh, to present at the National Business Aviation Association uh, a few years ago. And I did a very detailed examination of a Gulfstream crash on approach and landing that never, ever, ever should have happened. And it has since become one of the classic um, uh, examples. But it doesn't apply just to business aviation. It applies you know, to your Cessna 172 or your Bonanza or whatever else uh, you're taking. It goes into the psychology of why we do the things we do and why we make the mistakes we make. I do see a hand up. Ernst. Ernest, are you there? Uh, it still shows that you're muted. I'm clicking unmute. I think you have to unmute yourself. Not working. Ernest, hello? No? Okay. Well, with that, I guess I will um, close it out. And thanks, everybody, for um, uh, joining us today. I hope to see you better. online again. I apologize for the uh, which is getting it going, but I think I got it. Oh, somebody's there. Ernest, go ahead. Yes. Hi. I uh, actually connected uh, my microphone now. Oh, yeah. Um, hey, that works better. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent a uh, chat and I'll read it to you. Okay. On engine failure lower the nose. Can this be less than optimal sometimes? I think I want to find the best glide speed and an engine out practice. I was already faster than glide. So lowering the nose would simply add airspeed and I had to raise the nose to find the best glide. Well, that's, that, that's a good point if you're at best glide speed. But generally speaking, if the engine quits, your airspeed is going to start de uh, you know, deteriorating pretty quickly. You got a lot of drag out there with the prop. And chances are, in my opinion, if, if the engine quits, no matter what speed you're at, you're going to be at a lower airspeed within just a couple of seconds but behind that. So lowering the nose is kind of a... Uh, you know, just kind of getting a jump on that. Now, obviously, if you're at 200 feet off the ground, hmm, that might be uh, another issue. But um, do you want to elaborate on that? Give me your thoughts. Well, it was a uh, practice with my flight instructor. And I followed that lower the nose right away. And he admonished me, no, that's, you're just not doing it right. You have to find the best glide. Okay. So... Well, difference of, um, I'm, I'm sort of assuming, you know, that this is uh, an unexpected event. You're, um, you're flying along and all of a sudden the engine quits and your um, airspeed starts to deteriorate. Um, um, I don't know. My, my reaction usually is to lower the nose and I'll sort it out later. If I need to pick the nose back up to get back to best glide, uh, so be it. Granted, I might have lost uh, 50 feet or something in the process. And I suppose 50 feet could be interesting uh, later on. I... Um, Thanks for bringing that up. I <laughs> I just noticed the chat thing at the bottom, which is um, I'm new to that. So I'll probably have to go through those afterward, but I'm seeing some other hands come up now. So let me see, how about, uh, let's try this one. Gilberto? 
Yeah, do you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, just the gentleman that spoke uh, a few seconds ago, I was also told sometimes if you're cruising at nice speed and your engine quits, try to climb and then immediately sick uh, best glide because that you're, 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 you're buying time if you get some altitude, if you can afford that. What do you think of that? Yeah, that sounds good. I guess if you're at, at cruise speed, you know that uh, best glide is going to be lower than that. I guess you can go there. I guess I'll have to rethink my, uh, my thought of just lowering the nose when it, when it quits. I guess I'm sort of thinking about on a takeoff or something, but yeah, all good, all good points. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How about um, Scott? I think I just unmuted you. Are you there, Scott? Looks like your microphone is still muted. I'll try again. Scott, I think you, yeah, Scott, Scott's live, I believe. Scott? Yeah, not, not working. Not working. Anybody else? All right, let me, as long as we're still on here, let me go to this chat and see if I can, ah, there they are. I don't usually use chat and I, um, yeah, somebody asked me to please share the link for registration. I can't really do that because we're done. Um, uh, where, will there be a recording of this webinar? Yes, there will. Um, I don't have any idea where it will be, so um, give me some time on that. Check my website. We'll post it. Evemco said they would post where it would be, uh, would be also. Um, YouTube automatically records it. So uh, there should be one on YouTube if that in fact works. So we shall see. Somebody said, what time on Wednesday, 2 p.m. I've been doing them all at um, 2 p.m. Still allows me to get my nap, but um, not really. But um, 2 p.m. thought was kind of a easy time and um, we'll go from there. Um, what else we got here? Uh, they're kind of coming through here. Somebody asked about wings credit. No, nope, no wings credit for these. These are all have been accredited for wings credit in the past, but um, if I wouldn't be able to do three a week if I was doing wings credit. Wings credit uh, takes several hours to get through that in case of a webinar afterwards, sometimes many, many hours to sort who gets it, who needs it. And I don't have the information on who's on board and I'd have to post a quiz and it's a lot of stuff. So these are information only there's um, if you go to my website and then you go to the online courses, there are a couple of courses up there that are free and they're for wings credit. Um, just do that and it's pretty painless. Um, uh, what else we have here? All right. All right. I guess, oops, let's see. Okay. All right, I think we pretty much covered what was there. So um, at that, I will end the webinar again. Appreciate you very much for uh, joining us today. And um, you can always send me questions via email, gene at genebenson.com also. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you.